Thank you, and this morning we will be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27. Again, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 27. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. This is the word of the Lord. I was looking at the title that I gave this sermon, and I uh, have to confess, I'm not sure what I meant when I wrote it. I can't remember. Here is one good thing that will never come to an end. Well, maybe it'll come to me uh, before I come to it, the end of the sermon. I goofed on that one. But I didn't goof on something else. In fact, um, if I've accomplished anything, particularly over the past year, then it's been the reading of this letter to all the brothers and the sisters, even as it said, as Michael read it, verse 27, have the, I charge you. That's a command. That's a, that's a, it was a strong word that Paul used. In, in, and uh, I charge you. He, to have this letter read to the brothers, the brothers and the sisters, the church. Well, I've done that. It took me a whole year. But we went through it bit by bit by bit, as Paul commanded. I began, as I recall, last January at chapter 1, verse 1. And now we finally bring it to a close. We come to an end of... The study of Paul's letter, first letter to the ancient church in Thessalonica, we come to an end today, a whole year. Now, this original command that Paul gave to the first people, the people that he originally wrote to, and that he had Timothy, I think it was, his, his associate, his assistant pastor, his associate pastor, he, Timothy took the letter to the church, and they were to read it. Well, this original command was given to the elders of the church. Although the elders aren't mentioned, Paul just says, I charge you have this letter read. Well, we can reasonably conclude that Paul had them in mind because they were responsible, pardon me, they were responsible for the faith and life of their flock, of their church. Did you know that Presbyterian means elder? Presbyterian church, or pres Presbyterian means a church that is governed or ruled, watched over by elders, men from their own congregation, that the people of the congregation have um, voted on in an election and said, we want these men to be our elders. These men from among our own group, we want them to watch over us, to guide us, and to direct us. That's the way the early churches were set up. And so we follow that pattern. Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyter. Translated into English means elder. And the word can also mean overseer, shepherd. So, Paul certainly wanted these elders, the shepherds of this church in Thessalonica, to have this letter read because they were responsible for the faith and life of their flock. They were to make sure that the people understood this letter and that they lived it out in their daily lives because, as, we're going to, as we'll find out momentarily, this letter is the Word of God. It was God's words through human authors, giving God's instructions, giving God's very own thoughts in human language that can be understood. So with this serious duty of shepherding their flocks, pastoring them, um, along with Paul's charge re, um, resting on them, the elders would have gathered the people on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, Sunday, and then they would have read the letter and explained it to them. 
And so we just continue to do that. That's how the early Christians did it at the beginning. They met on the first day of the week because that's the day Christ rose from the dead and something new had started from Judaism. Uh, they, the Jews would worship on Saturday, the sixth, the sixth day or the seventh day. The Christians said, well, Judaism has fulfilled. It's done all that God intended for it to do. And now he's calling people to come to him through Jesus Christ. And Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So the early Christians began when they started worshiping right away on the first day of the week, what we call the Lord's Day, or in the general culture, Sunday. So, so the people would gather, the elders were there, and they took this letter and they, they read through it and they explained it just as I have done over the past year. Now their meeting together and their instruction would have taken a long time as they methodically um, worked their way through the letter. We might ask, well, would they have taken a whole year? Well, you know, they probably took a lot longer because this letter was all that they had to teach their flock about the Christian faith. They did not have the New Testament. They did not have the full, complete Bible that we have today. Why is that? Well, the full, complete Bible at this time, in about the year 50, 55 A.D., did not exist. The New Testament did not exist. The Old Testament did, but not the New Testament. The, uh, the book that tells us all about Jesus Christ, it didn't exist because it wasn't fully written. As I said, the Old Testament existed, and it could be used for Christian instruction and worship because studying the Old Testament, we see Christ in the Old Testament. But we see him much more fully, much more clearly in the New Testament. But we have to remember that when the apostles went around and preaching, all they had to preach from, because the New Testament did not exist, all they had to, all they used to preach from and to instruct the people and tell them about Christ was the Old Testament. And I'm sure glad we now have the New Testament because it's a lot easier. <laughs> the Old Testament can be really uh, uh, quite an undertaking. I mean, you see Christ in it, but not every page like in the New Testament. But he's there, and the, he's the promised one. And you always read of the promised one who is to come, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of David, the Seed of the Woman, the, the Son of Abraham. Always in the Old Testament, they're saying, He will come. He will come into the world. Repent and get ready and, and put your hope in Him. That's in the Old Testament, but it's much clearer, much easier to see in the New Testament. But anyway, when Paul and the others went throughout the ancient Roman world, town to town, preaching, they taught from the Old Testament. That's all they had. Now, it's highly unlikely that the church in Thessalonica had an Old Testament. I mean, there was a new church. These were new Christians. Uh, they had not come out of Judaism. Some of them did, but most of them were Greeks, uh, pagans. And they converted to Christianity. They put their hope in Christ when they heard Paul preach and teach. And, and you, you just couldn't go to the local store and get a copy of the Old Testament. I mean, they had to be, first of all, you had to, if you wanted to get one, you had to have someone make a handwritten copy for you. That's quite an undertaking. And you just couldn't go around and get a ballpoint pen or get your word processor going. You had to get... Sometimes they use animal skins or papyrus, and the average person just didn't have those in their homes. Professionals had those things. They had, uh, the Jewish people had men who were called 
well, they had a special name, I can't remember what it was, but basically their life vocation, that they were trained to do this when they were from being little boys, their life vocation was to copy the New Testament, the Old Testament. And they had a system of copying it so they wouldn't make any errors, which is easy to do, right? You've probably copied something, a letter or a recipe, and you're, you see it here, and then you're copying, then you read your copy, and you go, well, how did I make that mistake? It can happen. And so these counters, that's what they were called. Uh, they called them these people who copied the Old Testament by hand. That's all they could do. They were called the counters because they would count each letter. They take the original, they would count every letter. Every letter on the first line, and then every le- that same number had to be on the first line of their copy. Every letter of the second line, theirs had to be there. And then, in the very center of that original, there was a letter. So let's say they had ten lines of, of five words each, and all... And then they would count them up, and then they would find the one that would say they had a thousand letters from all these words. They would find out which one was number 500, which letter was the 500th letter. And that, when they counted up their copy, that same letter had to be the 500th letter. That way they were sure that they got the copy right, no mistakes. If that letter wasn't the 500th, Poor guy. Probably took weeks to make the copy. He had to take that paper and rip it up and throw it away and start again. I bring this up so that we could understand just you know how difficult it was to get a book in those days, copied by hand, by professionals who had all the equipment, very expensive. And the Jews, in copying the Old Testament, made sure that errors did not creep in, that the original they had, 500 copies later, that 500th copy, maybe 100 years later, would be exactly what the original had. By all that counting and getting the letters right. And if it wasn't right again, they would rip it up because they didn't want to get any mistakes. But we can trust the Old Testament. that doesn't have any errors in it. That's a little detour there. I think it's important for us to understand. And again, the Old Testament tells us about Christ. It's it's not as easy as the New Testament, but it's there. And the apostles use the Old Testament to preach and and to to bring people to faith in Christ and, and start new churches. Now, the local synagogue there in Thessalonica may have had an Old Testament, but they weren't going to let the Christians use it, much less let them have it, because, again, they were very expensive. But you'll recall from our previous studies that the Jews there in Thessalonica persecuted the Christians. They had run Paul out of town. They weren't going to go to the elders and say, hey, uh, I hear you don't have an Old Testament, and and uh, you really you need to be teaching your people about Christ. Well, here, why don't you use our Old Testament? It'll give you material. They weren't going to do that. So, again, all this church had to teach and to get sermons from, to teach from, was this one letter from the Apostle Paul of five short chapters. And Paul had been run out of town. He wasn't there any longer to teach them. So all they had to instruct them was this letter. That was it. Isn't that something? We have the whole Bible down, Old and New Testaments. They just had this one little letter. And uh, I think we can see from that why we could, or why I believe anyway, why I argue that their, their, their study... Uh, That book probably took longer than a year. Because it's all they had. Let me go back for a moment to what I just said about the New Testament not existing at this time when, when, when 
when Paul wrote this letter. It took about 60 years, 60. What is that in Spanish? 60 años, right? Did I get that right? After Jesus was born, I don't know how to say that in Spanish, sorry. for the whole New Testament to be completed. 60 years to write the New Testament. Why is this? Well, because the New Testament is written by a number of authors. The, writing, the apostles and those that the apostles approved of, like Luke and Mark, who wrote the Gospels of Mark, Luke and Mark. They were not apostles, but they were associated with the apostles. And the apostles approved them to write these books. We have the letter, that really small letter of Jude in the New Testament. It's one chapter. Jude was not an apostle, but yet he was associated with the apostles, and they could approve him as a teacher. And that what he wrote, they approved to be from God. <clears throat> So the New Testament took 60 years because it took that long for all these letters to be written. This letter to the church in Thessalonica was one of the first letters, as far as we can tell, it was one of the first letters ever written. And then it was later, it later became part of the New Testament. The other writings that make up the New Testament were written as the years progressed. They were written to churches or, into, in, or to individuals who lived in dif different circumstances and in different places and at different times in the first century. So, for example, Paul writes the letter to the church in Thessalonica, which we, his first letter he wrote to, but we're studying his first one. We call it First Thessalonians simply because the people in Thessalonica were called Thessalonians. He wrote the letter to the church there. They saved that letter. I mean, they're like, okay, this is instruction from the apostle. This is God speaking to us because it's from an apostle. We need to keep this. We need to study it. We need to learn all that's in here. And then there's a church in the uh, city of Philippi. And... Paul went there, preached the gospel, a church started, and then he left, and they now had elders in their church to, to run the church. And then Paul wrote a letter to that church, to the church in the city of Philippi. And the people there were called the Philippians. And so the letter to them is called Paul's letter to the Philippians. They probably didn't have the letter to the Thessalonians because it took a long time to copy and then you had to, you had to um, transmit, you had to, give them the, you had to send them by foot. You had to have a trusted, they didn't have a post office. You had to have trusted people that you could give the letter to, the copy that you had made, and that they would bring it to the next church. I hope this is not confusing, and I hope it's at least interesting that you'll continue to listen. Um, so, for example... You have Thessalonians. That church has that letter. I don't know, maybe a, a week's journey by foot. A little north is the city of Philippi. Church starts there, and Paul wrote them a letter. So now we have two letters, this church in Philippi and the church in Thessalonica. The church in Thessalonica says, well... You know, um, we would like other people to have this letter that Paul wrote. Or maybe the people in Philippi said, hey, we hear you have a letter from Paul. Would you make us a copy? And uh, we have a letter from Paul as well. We will make you a copy. So now the church in Philippi has the letter to the Philippians, their letter that Paul wrote to them, and they also have the letter to the Thessalonians. And the Thessalonians have the letter Paul wrote to them, and now they have the letter to the, to the Philippians. And that means now we have two, we call them books, two letters for the growing New Testament. And then there's a church in Rome, and Paul wrote them a letter. 
And they copied it, and they sent it to the churches, other churches. And those churches sent, copied their letters and sent them to Rome. And so the New Testament starts growing. The churches, all the churches are collecting these letters. And it wasn't until about 150 A.D., which is about 100 years after Paul wrote his first letter to the, Philipp- to the Thessalonians, that all the other letters and Gospels that make up the complete New Testament had finally been copied and spread out to most of the churches that existed. Again, you may think, why so long? A hundred years? Because you had to carry them by hand, crossing mountains, crossing rivers, watching out for bandits. And then they had to painstakingly make these copies by hand, and you may not, you know, you just couldn't run to the Walmart and get pen and paper. You may have had to wait weeks or months or maybe a couple of years for the, um, for the, the traders or the, the, biz, um, the, the marketers, whatever we would call them, who, who would travel from town to town selling their wares. And finally, they would come in. And they would have papyrus, and they would have ink. And after a year, you're finally now able to make your copy. And then, then you start sending them out. And all the churches begin collecting them. And finally, by the year 150, all the copies that had been made, that all the letters and gospels that make up the New Testament were finally in existence. And the churches said, the, we, we accept these as the word of God because they are from the apostles or those that the apostles approved of. This is the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. There were a lot of other writings that were known among the church at this time and farther on. They're called the interesting name, pseudepigrapha, which means the false writing. And over the past couple years, the past decade or so, people have made a big deal about some of these false writings and say, hey, why aren't they included in the New Testament? Well, the early church knew about them. And some of these pseudepigrapha are like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Barnabas. And the church said, well, are these... From God, are we to include them in our scriptures? Let's see, let's read them. And as I read them, they said, there's no way this could have been written by an apostle. Some of the stuff in it is just, just silly. Others go against the teaching of the apostles, and they said, no, we reject these. They do not belong in, this, in, in our testament because it's clear that they are not the word of God, not written by apostles. I'm preaching a false gospel, even. Well, again, we can understand, I think, from all this, why um, that the letter to the Thessalonians would have been read and discussed so often and for such a long time. Again, it's all they had. It's the only letter they had. And then maybe five or six years later, they would get the one from the Philippians. And then they would get another one from the Ephesians. And as these churches got letters from the apostles and copied them, the Philippians started, Thessalonians started collecting them. And they had other manuscripts, other letters to preach and teach from. So, Paul wrote because... He, he was no longer with them, thinking of the Thessalonians and the other churches. He came, and a lot of times he was driven out by people who hated Christianity. And Paul was the ringleader. He was the one who started all these churches. They wanted him gone. So often in fear of his life, he would leave and go to another place to minister. But then he would write a letter to the churches. And the churches would say, This is the very word of God. They received them as the word of God from his chosen messenger. 
They didn't see the writings, and nor should we see them as mere presentations of human ideas about God and about eternal life and how to live in this world and how to get to heaven. Just from the thoughts of a, a particular man or woman, that's not how they looked at these letters. No, it was God's word. Through the apostle, God speaking to them about important matters, about the forgiveness of sin, about how to live as Christians in the world, uh, what God himself is. And so we could say that God gave his people, he has given his church a hard copy of his words. We don't have to guess what his words are. We don't have to guess how we would what how to go to heaven. We don't have to guess how to have our sins forgiven. We don't have to guess about what God is. We don't have to guess about the kind of life that he approves. We don't have to guess about his relationship with us. We don't have to be in darkness, which is what mere human words or human writings give us. They don't have authority. But when the apostles wrote, they had authority because they spoke God's words. They wrote them down. They wrote exactly what God wanted them to write. No other human being could ever make that claim but the apostles. And so you see, this is why the church has collected all their letters. Because they're like, this is, what, this is God speaking. We need to know. And again... Allow me to repeat myself. It's a good thing that it's written down because now we have it in our hands. Does God love me? I don't know. What does is, what is the latest guru on TV say? All right, not very helpful, and he's just a man. How can I know it's sure and true and right? What, what, what does God have to say about it? There it is, written, pen and ink, for you to know clearly and see and touch and read. You don't have to guess. There it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's there. We don't have to guess. We don't have to be confused. But also because we have the hard copy of God's words, we don't have to be bound to traditions. We know exactly what God requires and how to worship him. And as I alluded to a moment ago, we don't have to rely on men and women who say that they've heard God speak to them or that they've had visions and dreams which they say reveal God's will to us. Don't, you don't have to listen to that because those people don't speak for God. They are not apostles. They don't speak God's words. They just speak from their own minds and may have interesting things to say, but it's not... It's not infallible, it's not perfect. Only the scriptures are perfect because they are exactly what God has to say to us without error. It came to us through human authors who did not make mistakes, God watching over them as they wrote, using the author's personality, using their education, and we would say it's Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but really it's God's letter, God's words to them. God, by the Holy Spirit, inspiring Paul, and then Paul using his own words, human words that we can understand, communicating what God wanted communicated. 
This is why we can trust the scriptures and why we should not, really, I would say, brothers and sisters, don't even pay attention to people who say, man, I had a dream, I had a vision, and this is what God said to me, and I had a revelation from God, and this is what he's saying. We should say, well, I have something better. I have the Bible, and I have it in black and white from God himself. You're just a human being. And maybe that dream was because you had a little too much broccoli <laughs> the night before in your meal. Don't even buy those books. They, 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 they can't help you. Usually they just confuse. You know, the latest author having detailing the visions or the dreams that he had. You don't need that. You don't want it. Just the words of men. Bible. Scriptures contain the very word of God. Spoken. Written down by his chosen messengers. No one else can claim that. Only the apostles and those that they approved can say, God spoke through us. We wrote it down without error. We wrote down exactly what he wanted us to say. No one else can say that. Now, let me real quickly kind of uh, talk a little bit more, prove what I just said, uh, that the Bible is the Word of God, or, or these letters that we're talking about now in the New Testament anyway. If you, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul makes a really wonderful statement, an important statement for us there. Uh, if you don't have your Bible or whatever, uh, if you just don't want to look it up, that's fine. I will, I will read it to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul said, We thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at, in work, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Okay, note, Paul said, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Paul the apostle, Silas, and Timothy, two men approved by the apostles to preach and teach. Paul says, you heard the word of God from us. You didn't hear the words of philosophers or interesting theologians you heard God's very word from us, what God wanted you to hear, what he wants you to know and to believe, and what you can count on to be true because God does not lie. He said, we preach God's word to you. And then he says, and you received it as such. You received it as the word of God. So he was speaking of the time when he was physically present in Thessalonica. <clears throat> Now, we don't know everything that Paul said when he was physically present in Thessalonica. He was there for a long time. But we do know that he did not stop speaking to them even after he left the city. He continued to speak. He continued to bring God's word. He continued to give them God's word in this letter. Even the apostles, what they wrote as God's servants, is the word of God. Not just what they spoke verbally, but what they wrote. And he, the Apostle Paul, and all the other apostles continue to speak to us, too. They speak by the letters and the other writings in the New Testament. They were God's chosen messengers. Thus, their words, their written words, which is all that we have, their written words, like their spoken words, are God's words. 
They tell us everything that God wants us to know for our comfort in this life, for our safety so that we won't go astray, and for our salvation. You know, we don't have to wander around confused and being led astray. We don't have to be like a rudderless ship being tossed and, and, and turned this way and that way by the currents and all the waves. We have God's words, brothers and sisters, in our very hand, in the Bible, the Old and New Testaments. God communicated his thoughts to these human authors and so that we could have his thoughts in human language that we can understand. Well, then finally, going back to chapter 2, verse 13, it also says that God's word works in those who believe. It works. It's active in those who believe it. This is what makes the reading and the studying of God's Word, the Bible, so important because it's the Holy Spirit's method. It's the only way that He works, that He uses to work in us. The Word has power. The Holy Spirit gives it life. The best thing about the hard copy of God's Word, it tells us about Jesus Christ. So that we can know for certain that when we die, we will go to heaven. You don't have to have any questions. Because it's very clear in the Bible. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what God says. You can trust him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. When we read the Bible, we begin to understand it. We begin to see Christ and his offer of salvation. Then it begins to make sense to us because the Holy Spirit is teaching us through it. He's working in us. And we go, I understand it. I want this. I want this life that Jesus Christ gives. We also have in the Bible the words that tell us that that the Lord our God will not forsake us in this life of tears and hardship and distress. We also have God telling us in his holy word from his apostles and the other writers that he called, we have them telling us, we have God telling us that when death comes, we will close our eyes in peace. Close our eyes in peace, looking forward to the everlasting rest and happiness that Jesus Christ will bring us into. This is God's message given through the apostles who first spoke it and then wrote it down for our comfort and our salvation. May God be praised for his abundant mercy and, and kindness to us in giving us the Holy Scriptures. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. We thank you that you have not left us alone in this life to be confused and to wander around in despair and worry or to be led astray by false teachers. Even Satan himself masquerading as an angel of light. You have given us your word, and it, in it we see your way, your truth. And you have given us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand it. And in your word you tell us about your beloved Son, who gave his own life in our place on the cross taking our punishment so that we could be set free from the penalty of the law. He offers us everlasting life. Father, we thank you for your great kindness in making these words known to us in the pages of Scripture. We thank you that you have not left us alone to wander, to be filled with fear. 
or to think, well, I guess this life is all that there is and there's nothing more. You have opened up eternity for us. We see it in your blessed words in the Bible. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you for our concluding hymn today uh, to turn to number 498, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, 498, and uh, I invite you to stand as we sing.